again and welcome to this program number nine in the current series. I'm Sherwood McCaskey, as always, thanks for your time. This week's program takes the form of a tale from the tomb. Today is a funny night. What you are about to experience is the gripping story of a Barbadian family seriously affected by the actions of the police on July 26, 1937, and whose members carried that pain and quietly fought for many years to right a deadly wrong that was committed. How were these family members affected? What about the sister of the deceased? In many instances, she felt as if she were the lone voice crying in the wilderness, seeking justice for her brother's senseless killing. The experiences of his mother, along with his experiences, are vivid in his mind. Well, when I was aged about seven, that's my first recollection. I remember carefully going to do screening tests at Conveyor. So that was a, a, a point that I could very well recollect in that my mother was telling me that my effort is not just for me, but she would always suggest or in, insist because of my appearance. I had looked so much like my uncle that I was her, in her mind, the manifestation of him. My height, disposition, even the clothes I wore. I had this preference for white clothes, so um, she didn't like me wearing white because he was the guy who wore white shirts, white pants, you know, buttoned up neck, or what we call the Nero neck type shirts. And um, some older gentlemen who lived around here <clears throat> always reminded me of that. So. It wasn't something that was just coming from her. These are people who were in the same era telling me how I looked like they would, they would call him Valet as his nickname. So, um, all white. So, that was always a tickler in my head. This is the story about his uncle who was in the prime of his life. He had just prepared for and sat a major exam the results of which seemed set to propel him in the direction of law enforcement. Now, because of the striking resemblance of his uncle, the elders in the community did not hesitate to remind him that he had to engage in something meaningful and make a contribution to Barbados and, in a sense, make up for the lost opportunities of his uncle. You know, you've got to do something with your life, you know. Your uncle was just on the cusp of going other places because he had passed the exam to join the police. At that, at that time, the police exams used to be done at the district here. You go in, prior to be reaching 21, you do whatever tests, you know, liter literal tests, arithmetic, English, comprehension, those basics. And when you reach the age, should you be less than 21, then they will call you up and you go up for your training and stuff like that. So he was just on the edge because when he died, he was 20, approaching 21. Sounds like the story of a promising young man set to do great things in Barbados and no doubt play a fundamental role in law enforcement on the island. But unfortunately, that was not to be. The same organization he had hoped to join and dedicate his life of service, he fell at their hands. Now, let us backtrack and pick up the story from the point when the family lived elsewhere. The stories were told by his mother, who remained firmly committed to the cause. She, t always, she told me that at the time they, they left St. Joseph, she left St. Joseph in 1936, right? Um, they lived on Clement Rock Estate. That is close to Lamming's territory. My grandfather was chosen 
if that is the right word, to work as the manager of the estate. Because I saw the photos indicating that. <coughs> I have another relative who I hope he's still in possession of them. But he, for some reason or another, seemingly, as I was told, he, he can't find them. I remember my grandfather, St. Joseph, looked like a black Billy the Kid, if you could, you, you know, remember the hat turned up flat this way. A cowboy, gun, long rifle, sheath knife, horse. He was the cow handler at the time. He always told me that they would be taking cows down to cattle wash. Because in those days, you know, you had different terrain, obviously. But you would take the cows down there to delice them, you know, delouse them, bathe them, stuff like that. So he had a good animal management skills. Well, there was quite a lot of movement across the island back then. Individuals from rural Barbados relocating to areas closer to the city. Anderson's family was among that number. But they told me my grandfather was brought down to Waterford, 1936. Probably duped into being down here because he suddenly, instead of living on the estate, was given a small tenantry spot and still handling the, doing the yard with the animals and stuff also doing watch my work on the pretext that he would graduate it never came came about <laughs> not as far as I, I'm aware because <clears throat> that didn't occur reasons being I don't know but you have to judge the times we're living in he also used to tell me his name is what got him in this trouble. You know, Preston Alexander Fairleigh Herbert Marshall. Right, German name Fairleigh. I think that the people would have been, if they were absentee owners, they were looking for a white guy. And that's a bold statement. I, I, I could, I could, and I think he, t he told me so too. You know, this Fairleigh thing, everybody thought it was Frederick. But it was Fairleigh, F R E D R L I C H. <laughs> The stories are so too familiar. He did make the move with his family and proceeded to St. Michael. Come down with the kids. <clears throat> my mother then, he was, he, my, the, her uncle, her, her brother, this would be correct name being Hendrick Law, but listed and titled during the presenting to the, uh, the, the reflections about the work as Kenneth Law. Because of a pet title, Nickname. <clears throat> My mother told me that when he first left St. Joseph, they called him Hendy. But when he came to St. Michael, they started with this Ken. So you could see the corruption of the title, and then that time would have come about. Ken Kenneth. Well, it would have had other <laughs> Kens that could have attached to it, but. It became Kenneth, and I think he accepted it too. Yeah. Let him call me that, mm -hmm. you right? I just don't know the outcomes of things. I'll just give you an idea of why the, why, why the listing is Kenneth Leroy Law. And that I've been trying to get regularized, and my mother too. But I think it was more painful for her to actually relive the whole set of circumstances because when, 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 she, when she came down, she was going to school at what was, what was presently Hinesbury School, but at the time it was called Miss Light Girl School. And that was a school in St. Michael Girl School that you could go to sixth form. A lot of the girls' schools had a cut off at fifth. So you, you go from primary, you go, after you clear the primary, then you had six levels to go. So she came down from St. Joseph. She attended St. Bernard School. And um, she came down and being a fairly witty young lady, she attended there. So give her, and she was given a form ahead, right? She was that 
gifted. Now back to the events that led up to the shooting of his uncle. His mother had the premonition that something was about to happen that would devastate the entire family. She told me that he left to go, he, he, to break, fill the breach between waiting on the police and damn um, thing. <clears throat> and living on an estate for nearly all the life working and stuff. He was a cooper, making barrels and stuff. So he got a job at the corner of Reed Street and Hart Street. So she said the morning she got up, she came on the, the tree, a tambourine tree, um, up Waterford, there on the main road. She actually told her mother she wasn't going to school. You know, she said she felt a bit uneasy about the turmoil and stuff, seeing all the police leaving the district here and heading for town. So she said she's not going to school. She said it's the only time, for, only time she ever did that in her life. The, 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 Objected the mothers and sisters that she's supposed to go to school, hell or high water. <clears throat> he went on to the work. He, he never, he didn't ride a bicycle. It was one bicycle and two brothers. The other brother, he took that bike. So he, he probably would have left early enough to get down to town. But she told me when the turmoil started, you know, you could hear in the distance, guys firing off the guns in the district here, probably making sure that they, everything is good. And um, people running, people coming out, a bridge down, running on foot, you know. It didn't kick up yet, but it, the, the, the tension in the area, <clears throat> you would have had all those people from the house to turning, St. George, St. Joseph, in those days people walk. 14, 15 miles, you know, leave home in the mornings at 3 o'clock and walk to town. Sometimes people come into town on Fridays, stay in town, get back home on Sunday nights. Because they have some relative in the area. You know, you transplant somebody in the, in the city. So you come down, you stay in town. Then you go back up Sunday evenings with whatever you might have purchased. So she saw the movement earlier the day, and it was unusual. So she stayed on the tree for the whole morning. The tree is still there on Station Hill. It was under that tree where his mother had the premonition about an event that would change the family forever. Well, you probably have guessed correctly. The opening sequence for this program is based on that premonition which his mother experienced under that tree. As she said around 10.30, <clears throat> she saw the police coming up the road on the bicycle riding fast. And she sat there, police came and asked if this is Mr. They used to call him Preston Marshall. That's his real name. But he used to go by Herbert sometimes. They would call him Herbert. Probably the Herbert was a you know, hyphenated title. <clears throat> if Herbert lived there, yeah. Herbert, you gotta come to town. Bring your wife. Right? Bring your wife now. Get to bridge town. He said the man didn't even wait for them. There wasn't any transportation. They took them, they walked down to the district air station. It's just from um, behind Common Mirror. But if you're going up the street, you know where Bellevue Gap, where they have all the fence? No, that, that was the Anthem Gap, ANTHGM. I got to school, Common Mirror, that was Anthem Gap, and then it would miraculously change one night. <laughs> you find the other people up here don't even consider that being Bellevue Gap. People refer to Anthem Gap each time. <clears throat> even some young people too, because they would refer to relatives and stuff refer to it as a, such. But she said that when she, when her mother told her don't leave, she was adamant that she was coming back. My grandfather told her don't leave. Something called be wrong with your brother. I hope you can get locked up. So they went to district here and they put them on a, I don't know if it was a van, buggy, whatever. Whatever was the vehicle of the day. 
because you have the, they have buggies and vans, right? And she told me that her parents still were there. When they got down to Hart Street, there he was lying in the road, one bullet going to the chest, dead. So she said they came back up. You know, from then, you know, it was madness, the whole of Waterford, because he was at the station, he was they were coming back up, they were just breaking the news on the way up. They said it was one hell. They came home, obviously my, my grandmother has lost it completely. My grandfather don't know what to do. Went to the police station nearly 1,000 times in an hour, but no word, no nothing. But people told him who had shot the boy, right? People told him who the person who shot him, descri description, everything. So my grandfather knew the person. Relative. A relative. <laughs> and <clears throat> to concrete it, when the morning of the 20th, you know, obviously, policemen, you know, you have a little break in your exercise, can't go, 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 I think. The gentleman came to my grandfather's house, weeping bitterly and apologetic, you know, of tears. I saw something like that last night in the picture, back in, regarding Hitler. You know, we were barely following instructions. But he had come out of the copper shop because the bars were outside on display. Obviously, shut down, burst down. That was the order. So he was rolling back. And I, I've seen people in, um, in some of the reels that were shown on CBC <clears throat> vouch for what my mom told me. And my grandfather told me too, but my grandfather never used to talk before about it very much. He will just be angry Angry, I mean, angry to silence. <clears throat> but he was bringing the barrels back inside the cup shop. You know, you, 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 whatever you used to do them, you break them, roll them, break them, roll them. And the word was advocated that the police thought he was stealing barrels. You have all the things you could steal in a way as a barrel that you would go roll all up Reed Street, Saddle Street, and wherever to get the water for it. Oh, if the owners of the place still in there. <coughs> so when he went, the barrel came down, and I said he was, might have already taken him, took him down about four of them. And then going back for the, the last few that were outside, two or three, is when the people came up from Lakes Folly onto Hart Street. And the man said, hey, yo, what are you doing? He said, when I could carry along one of these, or two of these, and fill it up with swank, you know. These people more hungry than, <laughs> these people more hungry than, uh, they're angry. He said there was a, pot, a lull, and then he broke the barrel down to, to, to roll it in. And then when he came back up, that was it. So those was eyewitnesses witnesses at the time that brought the, you know, give my, my, my grandfather the info. I, I know no lady, I can't get hold of her now. She told me she was four years old and she, they had the living, you know, those days, you lived on top. The grocery would be at the bottom. And she, was, she looked out and saw, she heard the noise, the backs, and she saw him, the body and the road just going through the final throws of death. What an experience for the parents. An eyewitness account of what happened to his uncle on that fateful day. Now, his grandfather received a visit from the man who, with a sorrowful heart, informed of the role he played in all of this. The gentleman came and he told my grandfather he was following instructions. This using live fire at the time, obviously, they had no 
Or what if you just your model thing, uh, rubber bullets and all that. So he was gone. And that triggered the riot because people scampered and head straight up to Queen's Park because that was the meeting point at the time or one of the meeting points for the rioters. The, I, my, my grandfather said on his way up, they were told that they were, the intention was to protect the people from Fonty Bell, who was, and Strathclyde. So you started from there, you, you start to crunch Bridgetown, you crunch and crunch Belleville, those areas. That was the Bridgetown aspect of it. You know, over the years I heard I had Christchurch and whatever and whatever. But um, that triggered a big blast down. <clears throat> People started to rip and tear. The effects of the riots in Bridgetown and other areas around the island were detailed in previous programs in this series. Now, traditionally, we formally come together, give thanks and celebrate with loved ones at the end of life's journey. The family takes charge of this and every step along the way is designed to bring closure. As painful as this might sound, this was not the experience of this family. Instead, their experience was one of indignation. The thing about it is that he was buried, and the document we show you here, he was buried on the 28th, unceremoniously. The Reverend Jones, O.M. Jones is written here in the document, he came, told my grandfather to get to the cemetery. They went down on a horse and buggy. Bare enough time to bathe. <laughs> and told him to get down there early in the morning and um, buried on the 28th, two days after. So I shot around 10, 10, 30 in the day. I'm buried before 10 o'clock in the morning, early. The Reverend stood over the grave and did his bit and commit the body. And my grandparents just had to get back out of town. Yeah, that was it. So you would have had some very angry people at the time. You know, angry. I don't know when other people were buried. I mean, obviously they would have, in many ways, detached themselves from one to hear about anybody else. They focus on how dare you treat my child so. Something interesting happened exactly three days after he was shot. And this peeved the already aggrieved family. Was this a form of compensation the family was expected to gladly receive and bury the incident forever? It's the day after the burial. Somebody came to the house. The person didn't state who they were, but they had his name, you know, Preston Marshall, Clementina, Law, and, you know, Red Bat, you know, it was righteous times and blah, blah, blah. Things of that nature. Explain the conditions. Hi. Explain the conditions of the time. And basically, them that these things happen. It wasn't done in a, you know, a, a solemn, morose manner. It just told him these things happen. And he'll be hearing from the government sometime soon. <laughs> and um, they gave my uncle, which was the older brother, to that one, a bicycle. And my grandfather told him, it can't come in here. You got a bicycle already. That was the, the dole, per se. They offered him a bicycle. Whether or not anything transpired with regards to compensation, I cannot say, neither could my mother ever tell me. And I don't think that if it were so, she wouldn't be aware of it. Because if, if in those days you were working for six and eight shillings, and suddenly you get a hundred, a hundred pound note, it is it, 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 it obvious. You, you see a, a difference. <laughs> you spend the power increase. You start to do something, even if it's memorializing the person. Nothing like that ever happened. 
<clears throat> I, I, I heard that people got money after they had the commission and stuff like that regarding the, the rights and stuff like that. But I cannot say if they ever got any compensation in that regard. Ever mindful of what occurred with his uncle, the family and neighbors shielded him from all perceived harm and danger. And this was demonstrated in the many courtesies extended to him in later years. And my grandfather kind of shielded me from, like the rest of the fellas were wrong, who could go and prick cane or something. My grandfather worked at Waterford. You get in cane, you don't have to go for nobody's cane. Another old gentleman that had a cane wrong behind, you know, you get in. You, you know, you look like that boy that died. You had to go and put yourself into trouble and stuff like that. So it, it always resonated with me as a youngster. <clears throat> Don't go into town. Don't, they would not even send me to St. Mary's Church. We were Anglican. I could go to St. Mary's Church. That's too close to where, to, to, to where your uncle died. I went to St. Mary's Church the first time. I can't remember when, but it could, it could very well be about 15 years ago, 2003, 4 approximately. But I could, I, could, I, could, I could not even, as a growing guy, working, let my mother know it passing through Heart Street in particular. I got to find some way of circumventing there. <clears throat> yeah, that was always bring back a uh, seriously negative impact on her. Understandably so. Now, how did the effects of these events manifest in the life of the mother? How did she deal with all of this? How did she commemorate her brother's killing for the rest of her life? Every, every, every 26th of July, we would be here as young children. And we could guarantee my mother disappearing from here. Disappearing. My father would just say, she's gone. <laughs> just like that. You know your mother gone. So we got to learn to cook. Because she's not coming back down. Well, in the latter years, she would come back the evening of the 27th. But she wouldn't come back down until, until the, the, the night of the 20th. She would go, go where her immediate relatives were from, St. Joseph, I stayed there. More likely Chimborazo. She went go to Cambridge Bay off and on, but go to Chimborazo. We had some relatives, the husbands. Um, husbands and marshals living up there. And, an, and an, a, a cousin who lived on the straight area on Goddings Road. So more often than not, the two of them would move together and just go, come back, and start the day all over again. Or she may go to Map Hill if she's walking. She will leave home in the morning and walk to Map Hill with my godmother and stay and just get the phone call, hey, not coming back home until this, over. <clears throat> years and years and years and years and years. When we acquired the TV, she wouldn't even watch the TV anywhere near that time. But one thing she was always objecting about, how dare them call my brother Kenneth. Kenneth, 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 that thing irritates me. With some vulgarities coming behind it. <clears throat> so that TV had to turn off in July 26. <laughs> we respectfully, we kind of grown and we could do it, right? I respectfully just let it pass. We had to go and watch TV. Other people, if you want to hear any commemoration, he wears. Probably got this lady here. Yeah, had a girl looking there. Or what, somebody else in the village. <clears throat> but that was really ripping her to pieces. From 1937 <clears throat> to the, she died in April of 1994. So she didn't see the July's commemoration, but. Now the story of how his sister never got over the senseless killing of her brother on July 26, 1937. 
These are other stories of the riots, those stories that are to be told if we are to continue deconstructing its history and placing the events in their true perspective. Thanks for your time. I'm sure with Majaski, this has been... Today is a funny night.